Hello everyone, this is Leslie Pelch at Vermont Center for Geographic Information and I'd like to welcome you to our webinar, webinar today, Mapping It Up in Vermont and New Hampshire. And uh, I'm going to start off with a very brief intro to make sure we're all on the same page in terms of using the GoToWebinar interface and then I will hand it over to Shane Bratt from UNH Extension and he will do the first part of our webinar today, talking about the uh, granite. Uh, map viewer. So I want to point out to everyone that you can open and close the panel that is, should be appearing on my screen. It's on the right. Don't know if it's on the right or on yours, but there's a little panel. There's an orange arrow button that you can use to get it out of the way. It kind of collapses it. Um, and then you use that same button to open it back up if you want to check something out on the panel. You should, if you have not already or if you're having any issues, open up the audio panel and you open things by clicking on the plus sign to see what's in there. Um, make sure you've got that set correctly. If you can't hear me, <laughs> it's particularly important to set it to either telephone or mic, depending on what you're using. And if you are using a telephone, you'll have to um, dial in the number and use your audio pin. But please make a point of noting that you need to use the number that's actually in your panel, not the one that's here. When uh, you have questions, you should feel free to submit them using the question box, uh, text questions. Everybody's muted. You don't have to worry about noise in the background. And those questions will come to both Shane and I. Shane's going to be an organizer on this as well. And um, so you can submit them at any time and most likely we'll uh, wait until the end of our sections to answer them. But if there's a question that's particularly relevant in that moment that really needs to be answered or if we've done something wrong, um, we should see those in time to notice it. I would like you all to notice this other little button that looks like an orange hand with a green arrow. If everybody could click on that, that's the raise your hand button. And if everybody clicks on that, then I kind of know that you can mostly hear me and you're paying attention. Great. Thank you. And um, Let's see, the only other thing I was going to say, I mentioned the questions and answers probably towards the end. Um, this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted at BCGI's YouTube page. And when I do my section, I'll briefly show you where that is, how you can get to that on our website. Um, I think that's all I have to say. And I'm going to hand things over to Shane now and he will kind of introduce himself and also some other important people. Who are not actually going to be presenting. Okay. And there's Shane. Do you see a full slide on the screen right now, Leslie? Yes, I can see your slide. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, Leslie, for organizing this and letting us uh, partner on this webinar. I thought it was really interesting that both New Hampshire and Vermont are sort of going through a similar thing at the same time, producing new online map viewers and also using some of the same technology. So. I think this is great. And also, if you look at any map of New Hampshire and Vermont, we share a long border. So it certainly makes sense for people in both states to realize what's going on on the other side. Uh, just a couple of quick things. First of all, as Leslie mentioned, my name is Shane Brott. I work for UNH Cooperative Extension, and my job is an extension specialist in geospatial technology. So I'm trying to look at what is out there for mapping technology and trying to figure out how the people of New Hampshire can benefit from it. Now, I work a lot with New Hampshire Granite, but I don't actually work for New Hampshire Granite. And just so you know, the three people listed down below, Faye Rubin, Chris Finuff, and David Justice, are on the line today. If there's any questions that I can't answer, and I imagine that there will be, they're, uh, they're willing to come to our aid and at least answer it by typing in the box. So again, I don't work for Granite, but I work with them. And to me, having these mappers is something that I think greatly increases the availability of this sort of data to the people of New Hampshire because we all know that GIS is wonderful, but at a certain point, 
people are stymied by the technology involved. So I think that this has been a tremendous benefit. This also, this new version is quite a bit enhanced compared to the previous version. And I'm excited to show this to you and also to have some questions. So just very, very briefly, the history of this. You know, for people from New Hampshire may, may or may not remember the New Hampshire Granite Data Mapper, which originally was the Conservation Lands Viewer. This was the first version of Granite's online mapping system. It was pretty far out ahead of its time when it first came out. It was heavily customized, I think mostly using Arc IMF and a lot of custom code. And when I first started my job, I offered a lot of workshops in partnership with Granite to spread the word about this and to get people to use it. Well, Obviously, over time, technology changes, and a few years ago, Granite moved to using a more modern system and also looking at different ways to present information. Obviously, with the development of Flex and such tools, your ability to interact with the map is, was greatly increased compared to the previous version. So this is what Granite View looks like, looked and still looks like, and this was built on top of Flex. Now the current version, which has just officially been released a few days ago, of the new mapper is called Granite View 2. Now this will replace Granite View, and the data mapper disappeared years ago. Uh, based on the little notice that I got when I logged in today to this map, it turns out that Granite View will be maintained probably through the end of June, and then after that it will disappear. So Granite View 2 is really the way that Granite is going to share its information going into the future. Now briefly, uh, what data are on Granite View 2? Well, obviously New Hampshire Granite has all of their data. I think that might be true. Maybe Faye or uh, Granite people can pipe up if there are data sets that are not there. But virtually all of their data are there. There's also background maps that you can add from Bing and, also, and Esri. And also one of the factors I noticed when I was playing around with it recently is that you can add data directly from ArcGIS Online. So the search incorporates, or the search allows you to query. You can put in URLs if you have them, but also you can find things on ArcGIS Online. And the technology behind it, and the grant people can speak up if there's more questions specifically about this, but my understanding is it runs an ArcGIS server to provide a lot of the background. It's using Silverlight for the interface right now, and all of this is built on top, or using GeoCortex Essentials, which is something that UNH, uh, both from New Hampshire Granite and also the, the facilities folks, have been experimenting with and using over the past about year, year and a half. So, now the first thing to notice when you uh, when you open up Granite View too is that it looks similar to Granite View if you use it, but there are definitely some differences. One thing I like is down here in the bottom, there's this status bar which shows you what's happening and if it's complete. You can also take all of these panels in this sidebar and move it out of the way simply by clicking here to hide the information panel, and also here to hide those. So it allows you to make some of those disappear and get a full full view of the screen. And you could do this with the Flex, but it was a little more cumbersome. Now, this site info just gives you some basic information, but for the most part, people are really interested in seeing the map layers. So we'll go ahead and, and open that interface up. Now, this allows you to add whatever data layers you would like out of Grandis Holdings. And as I said, the vast majority of them are here. Now, one of the things that I found with Granite View some even with a data mapper that confused people is that it's very easy to not make sure that the correct number and hierarchy of check boxes are checked. So sometimes, for example, if you turn on, um, let's say, orthophotography, and this is accidentally unchecked, you may not see anything at all. So keep in mind, they always upstream of everything that you check all of the boxes need to be checked in order for them to be displayed. And this is you know, similar to navigating in the Windows hierarchy. It's also similar to ArcGIS, but that's something I've seen people stumble at. You, of course, have the ability to make the layers transparent very easily by dragging this back and forth. And you also have the ability to set some of the features and use values in the database to influence what the map looks like. So attribute data in certain features are available 
to use. So for example, in conservation, you could have a solid. You could also have diagonal hashing instead. And you can use some of the attributes, such as agency type, to color the map as well. Now, how would you know what these actually mean? You click on this right here, it shows the legend right in stream. So you can figure out what's state, what's federal, what's other. So all of the layers look very similar. They work in a similar way. Not all of them can have the attributes used to control the symbology, but a good number of them can. Now, something that's interesting about the orthophotography, and let me go ahead and uh, zoom in here. Actually, I can just do it from here. Is that you have not only the RGB or the true color imagery from this latest flight, you also have the color infrared imagery. Now, it doesn't make as much sense at this scale, so let me go ahead and zoom in. We'll talk more about these tools later. But this is something that wasn't available statewide until very recently in, in 2010, 2011 flight. And your ability to access this online, of course, is tremendously useful, especially when you're looking at vegetation or landscape features. You can also see that the NAEP imagery so the agricultural imagery program imagery and these newer high resolution imagery programs are available both in true color RGB and color infrared. And that to me is a tremendous benefit to having granite data available on a web interface because you're not really going to get that sort of data in most other places. So if you understand granite data, you can see a lot of the categories here. We don't have time to go through every single one, but obviously you had floodplains, the conservation which we focused on, recreation, soils, a whole bunch of things underwater, and topography. Now keep in mind that some of these vary depending on the scale that you're zoomed in. So scale dependent rendering is available and it's default. One of the things that of course you need to understand, and if you're a GIS user you do understand this, but if you're not, not all data are available or relevant for all scales. So it's something, if you don't see something appear when you check a box, try zooming in and out and looking at greater scales. Now, these tools up here, how do they operate? These are the tools that let you move around the screen. This site info just gets you back to the beginning, but these are the tools that you use to interact with the map. Now, the zoom in button does not zoom in, it just turns your mouse into a zoom in tool which allows you to click, draw, and zoom to a specific location. Similarly, the pan tool turns your mouse into a panning instrument and allows you to move across the map. The initial view gets you back to that full state view and back and forward allow you to go back through previous zooms and forward to the next zoom level. You have a scale that you can set if you know you want to be at a particular scale. And there's also the ability to set bookmarks. If you are in a certain area of the state you'd like to be able to zoom back to quickly, you can go ahead and add a bookmark and then have those acts accessible so that they can bounce back and forth to different locations. Now there's a variety of ways that you can export and there's a variety of ways you can print. Let me just turn on one example here. Uh, water resources maybe. Also topography. So maybe this is not the greatest map in the world, but assuming that you wanted to be able to print this or export this map. Your options for doing that are right here. And the interesting thing, of course, is that you have a lot of control, and this is very similar to Granite View over what you export, how you export it, what the current scale is, and you can also click Preview Extent, which will give you an idea of what part of the map will be contained in that export. And as you change the different scales, that area that it would cover on the map will change accordingly. Now, as far as exporting, there's a variety of ways that you can export the map. 
And I think maybe that's something that um, Faye can address. But there's a variety of ways to export it. And data sources is the tab where you're really supposed to use to interact with a lot of these different layers. Notice that you can reorder the layers. And this is something that's new that wasn't available in Granite View, or the original Granite View, that allows you to control by dragging and dropping the order layer and also even within the layer itself be able to influence some of the features that are being displayed. So that is a big improvement over a previous version. You can add, this is what I was talking about, adding geo services. So if you have maps coming from other locations online or if you'd like to search for something, I know my friend Greg in Rhode Island, quite a bit of data posted. You can search right in this interface and add things directly into the map. So that, again, big benefit. You can add data from the outside. You can also add in shape files and CSV files to the map, which, again, is, is a big benefit compared to the previous version. I thought these were pretty slick, these external map viewers. So if you're in this location on Granite View and you'd like to see that same location in Google Maps, you can click this button and it'll open up that location in Google Maps. Same thing with Bing Maps. You can click on this and it'll spawn an external viewer just at that location. The interesting thing, and if I break these off here for a moment, um, what you'll see is that these are synchronized. So for example, if I'm in Granite View 2 and I move to a different location, that other map moves accordingly. So you can be looking and moving around, zooming in, zooming out. And that second map is acting accordingly. I found that the zoom works in big maps. It does not seem to work, at least for me, in Google Maps. But the Google Map does move around when you move. Now, there's a lot of different ways. It's pretty much just like a, a full GIS program that you can query. You can use points. You can draw lines, polygons. You can either have that shape be buffered and look for results based on only certain layers in the map. You can also do filtering. So this is sort of back to that query builder interface, and even an advanced query builder is available. You can use spatial filters to say just within the current extent, let me find something, or you can look across the entire state. And you can search this layer. So if you only want or the layer list by names, if, let's say you only wanted to look for watersheds, you could have this select none and then check only the watershed layer that you'd like to search so that you'll are effectively only dealing with that layer, or showing the results for that layer, excuse me. So this is really pretty much a full-blown query capability, just like desktop GIS. Now drawing tools, there are quite a few ways to draw on the map and even edit your drawings. So if you have a triangle or a polygon or ellipse you'd like to draw, let's just go ahead and do a polygon. The one thing to be careful of, which I think is often people don't do, you have to change the border in the fill before you start drawing. But this is the default. And if you finish and double click, you can then either undo what you've done, clear all, or you can even go back and edit what you've done to change that polygon or that feature that you've drawn. And when you click this, that goes ahead and undoes the edit. Interestingly, when you draw something on this using these tools, you can also export that as a shape file and download it to your computer to save for use in, in GIS or even to send to someone else. I found this feature that you can snap two other layers. I think that is, I found it interesting to see how it works in practice. I think will be uh, probably depend on what exactly you're trying to draw, but that is a very nice, nice feature that you don't necessarily have to do all of the drawing completely by hand. So if you'd like to do another feature that has a different border, so we want the border to be red, say we want the thick, oh, sorry, thickness to be 15, I guess. 
Oh, I just learned something. Okay, I guess when you're in editing mode, this will actually influence what the shape looks like. I apologize for that. And the fill, and you can set the transparency of both the border fill and the thickness all independently. So as long as you're editing, those changes apply to that shape. So a lot of people wanted to be able to draw on maps. I know the data mapper was, you couldn't do it. On Granite View, you could do it to a certain extent. But that feature is greatly, greatly enhanced in this new version. And the ability to save as a shape file, I think, is also pretty phenomenal for people who don't have a lot of experience using GIS and maybe would just like to have mark an area on a map and be able to send it to somebody who does have GIS. I think that's a phenomenal feature. So I'm not going to go through examples of all of these, but you get the idea that you can create and draw things on the map. The last section here to notice is the measurement tools. So what this allows you to do is look at distance and area, and it also allows you to decide what units of measurement are going to be used. And the changes made in these are shown real time. So if we have distance, for example, and you, you choose the line, you start clicking and clicking, and each, vert, each segment will have the distance shown. And when you're done, by double clicking, you have the distances shown for each segment. And if you change this, those distances adjust as you change the features, or the, uh, the sorry, the units. Similar thing for area. Now what you've noticed is when I clicked on the next drawing or measurement feature, the current one disappeared. And notice, of course, when you're doing area, you have the choice of both how the perimeter is displayed and also the area. When you click this button, if you wanted to save this for some reason, you can click Add as Drawing. That will cement it to the map. And then as you continue to draw or measure other features, that previous measurement will still be visible. So this was something, the ability to measure and easily have that information available, I know, was something that was of great interest to people. And you can, of course, the clear all will get all of those off the screen if you want to remove them. Now, something interesting about the measurement tools as well is it allows you to enter a coordinate and zoom to that coordinate, which is a big request that people had. Notice that you have a whole bunch, bunch of different coordinate systems that you can use, including some that the New Hampshire data are in and others that they're not. So latitude and longitude was a big one. And just by entering the coordinates, you can go ahead and plot one, excuse me, plot one, plot it on the map. Now, if you don't know the coordinates, but you just want to find out what are the coordinates for a certain position, that's where the plot feature comes in. By clicking on the map, it produces a little pop-up bubble showing you exactly what the coordinates are. And if you change the coordinates here, so for example, instead we wanted to do degrees, minutes, seconds, that'll update the information as well. You can also do that down um, in somewhat a similar way down here, where that shows the location of your cursor in X and Y, and you can change the settings for that as well. So now there's lots of different ways in the map to zoom to a certain location, also to take and plot different locations and have them shown on the map itself. And if you want to get rid of these, you can go ahead and click on Clear All. Now the final thing to look at here before maybe talk a little bit more about questions, why don't we turn off the topography. Notice also, also the drawings you can turn off here or turn them back on. When you go out to this available layer, these show you the available background map. So Granite has the default set, but you can choose a lot of different options, including those provided by Bing. Make sure that the top one above it is off. Whatever is higher on this list will dictate what's shown. And you have a whole bunch of different options that you can use for that background map. So it takes granite data. It takes the data that you can add yourself by CSV, shapefiles, by drawing. 
It also has data that you can grab from other servers if you have the URL, if you're on ArcGIS Online. So there's a lot of different ways to get data into this map. And that alone, to me, is something that is quite significantly different than the previous versions, and I think it makes it much, much more interesting to a lot of users. So that was just a very quick whirlwind. We could go through and spend more time on individual features, but I want to sort of touch on everything at once and then open it up for questions if people have comments or ideas or things that were confusing or a lot more detail. So Shane, do you see the questions that people have already set in, sent in and comments, actually? I do not see the questions. You do not? Oh, oh, I have to open it. Yeah, you have to open up the little question panel. Oh, oh, all right, I see oh, it now. <laughs> okay. Okay, the only, this is Faye just mentioning that the only exclusions for data that are not included, granted data that is not part of this, are just data that are sensitive on, or that you need specific authorization to use. Or there are some data sets that are available only for very small regions of New Hampshire and they may not be included, but except for those few circumstances, pretty much everything the grant it has is available through this. So we've had a couple of questions asking about how this relates to Vermont's map and as soon as I'm done with this, Leslie's going to fire up and talk, talk to you all about that. Okay, so a question, Jeff, Bechtel, are any other data sources, can you import any other data sources in future releases like DWGs or GeoTIFFs? So that would be a question out to people who know the answer to that. I'm not that person, but I'm putting it forward to other people. <laughs> choice of coordinate systems available. I don't know if that means choice of coordinate systems that data can be added or choice of coordinate systems for you to view um, here in the measurement tool. I would assume that you meant coordinate systems for adding data, but I am not sure. There's a chance he means, although I think he asked this question before you got to this part, it could be uh, exporting or extracting data. Oh, extracting data. That is a good question. Know. I do not know. Import GPS data is another question. Yes. Um, to me, it would seem like the way to import GPS data is to get it to, as a shapefile or a CSV file. That's usually fairly easy to do using you know, free tools like DNR GPS. Um, exactly how well that works, I would be interested in seeing. I haven't tried that yet, but that would be my, my thought process on that. As long as you can get it into a shape file or a CSV file, you should be able to add it. My guess would be that that would be latitude and longitude WGS84, but I don't know. Question, if you have added a WMS, is there a way to save that view so that you don't have to re-add it several days later? So the idea is if you add data, whether it's a WMS or not, is there a way to save that information in the map so that if you come back in the future, you won't have to go and re-add the WMS? Hey, Shane, can I ask you to hold that question? Because <laughs> I was, I was going to demonstrate that on ours. Lovely. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> I passed the buck. <laughs> Okay, another question. Do Granite and, and VCGI coordinate <laughs> so that you can see a viewer that basically spans the border if you're working in two adjacent states? We're Americans. Um, <laughs> the, way I, the answer right now, and I may be forever, is probably no. Well, the answer right now is no. The reason is that each state, the way that GIS data infrastructure works in the United States, that each state is responsible for sort of managing, distributing their own data. There are ways that you could do that, of course, um, using a real GIS program or a, sort of a desktop GIS. And, and the background layers themselves that you can see that Granite provides and VCGI span that area, but the data that they provide through their online viewer is specific to that state. Although I will say one thing, actually, um, we do put out what we call our base map, which is really, which is not just orthophotos, but many different uh, vector layers. We put that out as a web map service. 
So actually, you could pull that service into the Granite viewer, so, and you would have a lot of the sort of the basic data, at least from our viewer in their viewer. Yeah, well, and you're right, and that's only available through this newest version. That's a very good point. Is there an ARC IMS server URL where Granite data can be accessed for the public user to pull into ARC map? Um, there are a variety of WMS services that are available through Granite. Uh, also, I know that a lot of those services are listed on ArcGIS Online, so as long as you have a version, you can search for it just integrated if you have version 10, or if you obviously know the WMS service, you can. Whether or not there's an ARC IMS server, server URL, I don't know if that's something that's different. And say uh, if that's something that's different that you're looking for, or if the WMS and or ArcGIS Online accounts for that. And Granite want, uh, Faye wanted to also mention that Granite also publishes a base map service, which of course is right here, um, the layers that are shown here. So you could do it the same thing. You could have, I assume that your viewer takes that as well? Yes. But, yes. So you could use Granite's I base map service and then put it into BCGI's viewer. I just want to point out that Faye did also uh, respond to that question about supporting other formats. Oh yeah, I skipped over that. Go ahead, you can read it if you want. Uh, she just said she's not aware of immediate plans to support formats other than shapefile, CSV, and services, but there are GeoCortex people on the webinar, so if anyone, any one of them wants to answer that question in terms of uh, future functionality, they can send a little comment in through the question box. Uh, the uh, so two other quick questions. Uh, where are free tools for converting to shape files? I was specifically talking about GPS. If you have GPS data on the GPS unit, how you could convert it to a shape file. And by far the best one that I know of, assuming that you're just looking for a standalone program, is this uh, DNR GPS, which used to be called DNR Garmin. It's a long story, but uh, now this is an open source application started here at Minnesota DNR and now is out there in the wild and it supports up to the latest version or pretty close to the latest version of ArcGIS. But I always tell people you don't need to use it with ArcGIS. You can use it as a standalone app no matter what it is that you're going to do with the shapefile. And this is a perfect idea of, or uh, demonstration. You can have your GPS, bring it in, and just use this program to download the shapefile to your computer and then bring it into the map. And data from Canada? Okay. That's a good question. I would assume that as long as there's WMS services from Canada that you could add them to the map as well. I would also see what they have available in ArcGIS Online for that. Mm -hmm. And the last question, and I'm going to answer, but I need people to chime in about this. Is ArcGIS Online available to the public without fee? I assume that that is a question regarding whether or not you can add ArcGIS Online data layers to this map without having to pay a fee, and the answer is yes. Yes. Or yes, it is available without a fee, and we already had a couple of people, or at least one people, person <laughs> chime in about that, because it's coming through Granite's web map interface. Yep. Okay. We run out of questions. Is there anybody else just itching to ask one last question before we move over to Vermont's viewer or any of the Granite people? Are there any final statements or thoughts that you want to make about something I may have missed or misstated or a feature you think is important for people to know about? Looks good. One last thing that I'll say while people are thinking for one more minute is uh, I didn't explore all of these data layers because that would just take a lot of time, but there's a lot of different data that are available, and I encourage people just to go explore, turn things on and off, drill down, see what's there. And you could spend a whole hour just going through all the different data layers that are available. And Faye says she thinks you're all set unless there are any other questions. So I don't have anything else, and I'd be happy to pass off to Leslie to talk about what's going on in Vermont with VTGI. Okay. Do I have to give you back control, or can you just take it? Uh, you have to give it. I think you have to give it back. 
Um, change presenter. Oh no, I already see your desktop. Oh, you do. Okay. <laughs> maybe, maybe because I was the original organizer, I get to just steal it back from you. Um, so um, Shane covered a lot of the things that I would have covered if I was doing this by myself, because of course we have very similar viewers. So I'm actually going to just start out by pointing out that um, you can get to our new viewer. We haven't. We haven't. Actually, so it's very similar to Granite in that we are putting up the new version of the viewer. We're calling it actually Beta 2.0 um, in parallel with our existing viewer for a couple of months. And around the same time period, I think we will switch over to the new viewer. Um, so there's a link on our front page right now over in the VG, Vermont GIS News. It's a little blog entry. And you can get to the new viewer, the Beta 2.0, from here. If you try to get to the viewer from the normal link that's on our front page, you'll go to the old viewer. So just keep that in mind. If you're looking for the new viewer, this is how to get there. And I also want to point out that we have a user survey. So we're in this uh, beta release right now, partly because we want to get feedback from the initial people who do try it out and have an opportunity to, to do a few more tweaks uh, if we need to before we actually replace the old viewer. Uh, so I'll just open it up and what you will see is that it is very similar to the uh, granite viewer for some reason we have a blue theme rather than a green theme in terms of the colors of all the little buttons but other than that and we do I actually can't remember right now if when Shane first opened it up if the toolbar was up here was open or closed but similar to the granite one you can make it go away if you find that it's in your way or you can keep it open. Um, by default, we have ours open, and we do also have the map layers showing. Um, you'll see if you play around with everything that there are a lot of different ways that things can look. You can hide the toolbar. You can also um, you can turn this back into a list of things to do rather than the list of layers. Um, so you can kind of make it look the way you want it to look. So, one of the things that came up that I wanted to point out um, is, oh, and, I'll, and obviously also we've slightly different names for our sections up here, but you'll notice really that the tools are similar. They may be in slightly different combinations as well, but I think we've chosen actually the identical tools. Um, so in the upload draw is where we can add data, as Shane pointed out, map service, uh, shapefile, and CSV. One thing I want to point out about the shapefile is that you have to make a point of adding all three most important portions of a shapefile. So if you're not familiar with shapefiles, this is something to really pay attention to and be careful about. Um, we do actually have this little pop-up reminder here. So even if your shapefile is composed of nine files, um, the important thing is that you just need these three, the DBF file, the PRJ file, and the SHP file. So just be careful to get all three of those when you go to add a shapefile. And it does take a minute for it to load a shapefile. This is a town. Oh, of course. <laughs> yeah. Live demo is never a good idea. We'll see if oh, it's not going to let us cancel. Um, and then I'm hoping that if I can get this to close back down, wow. Hmm. I'm going to show adding a map service, and hopefully I can add the granite base service, base layer service. I have a funny feeling I'm going to have to shut everything down first. Yeah, sad face, that's right. Let's try that again. All right, so let's go back to adding a map service instead. 
So on ours, it automatically starts searching for services, and you'll notice that actually a number of the ones that come up listed first are indeed ArcGIS.com. So those are coming from ArcGIS Online. Um, I like to point out that if you're really, if say you're a Vermont person, and you're really just interested in VGI, VCGI services, you can type in VCGI as a search word, and you'll primarily get ours. Might be a few others. So that's a good thing to know. Um, in Vermont, Agency of Natural Resources also has a lot of services posted, so you can look up ANR Maps. It's another uh, a good search word for um, services for Vermont. And let's see if I can find the granite. So there's base layers for New Hampshire. Let's see how this works. There we go. Okay, so in order to add a map service, you have to go through a little wizard. You choose something, you go to next, gives you an alias, there we go, a little preview. Actually, I thought it gave us an option to change the alias, but perhaps not if it's an outside VCGI. All right, and there's New Hampshire. Ta-da! Ta-da, it actually worked. Although, I'm not sure it's drawing quite right. Might just be a little slow. Okay, so I wanted to point that out since it came up in the other, uh, in Shane's portion. Um, I'm not sure if that's taking a little while to draw, which might help me to point out a difference about our map that has mostly to do with um, how we've chosen to do our data layers. So there's the granite view that I just added that's up at the top. Uh, the very first thing listed normally on ours is this cached base map. So we chose to create a cached base map, which is the same as um, granite's base layers, sort of a, a set of data layers that we called our base map. We've created a cached version, which means we've essentially taken snapshots of it at all different zoom levels and um, made those available. And the idea is that it's faster performance, that as you zoom in and, um, and move around on the map, it's a lot quicker to draw because it's essentially just pulling already created images rather than dynamically creating them as you zoom in and as you tell it where you want to go and how far you want to zoom in. So that's the cached base map, which is on by default. But we can turn that off. Oh, and we can even, well, and we can, oops, sorry, we can turn on the dynamic base map, which is essentially the same thing except that in the dynamic base map, we can turn the layers that are included in there on and off. Let's go back. So in the cached base map, what you're seeing is that they're all listed out, but we can't actually turn them on and off because they're essentially already baked in. They're already there, and, uh, and that's why it draws quickly. But with a dynamic base map, we can get exactly the same layers, and we can choose to turn things on and off if we don't want to see them. Okay. So the idea of the base map is just a convenience. And here we have two different kinds of convenience. One is drawing fast. One is having the ability to have these popular data layers that, can, that we consider the base map, and, but you can still choose to turn them on and off. Our third option is this list of popular layers, which goes a little bit beyond the base map. So the base map we have chosen not to change very much over the years, but we do recognize there are some other data layers that are uh, useful and of interest. And, um, and so we sort of thrown those into this category called popular layers. So if all you ever looked at was dynamic base map and popular layers, you'd probably see most of the data layers that are commonly used and wanted. And um, But there's more, because as Shane said about the granite viewer, and ha as was not the case with our, the previous version of our viewer, we have tried to get most of our data into this viewer. So we have a lot of different data layers available. 
and I'll just open some of these up so you can see them. And most of them, not quite all, because there were some layers that were either so old or so difficult to represent in this, this um, setting that we chose not to include them. But most of them are in here. So if you go through an oh, open... Lovely. I'm just looking yep. at the question. I just had a oh. comment that there's a lot of scale dependencies set in the base map service in Granite as well. Yep. So if you zoomed in and out, you'd see something more like you would... Okay. You were I, I think I thought maybe it wasn't drawing right just because I thought it had looked different when you opened it up, but that may not be oh. true. <laughs> yep. Um, okay, so there's one of my points is just that it's really worth looking through if you're interested, if you're especially if you're looking for a particular data layer that you know we have. Um, it's worth opening all of these up and seeing what's available in here. And as uh, Shane pointed out, make sure you know what you have clicked on because notice that just because mean annual precipitation is clicked on here doesn't mean it's showing because climate is not currently clicked on. So if we put it on there, we'll see it. There's mean precipitation. Um, let's see, I think Shane pointed out a lot of the things that you can affect on the individual data layers, but I'm not sure if they were all exactly the same or if you went over all of them, so I'll just quickly mention them. Um, if you're not, let's just turn that on. If um, you're not currently at a scale that a particular data layer shows at, this zoom to visible scale will be um, will be active, and you can click on it, and it will zoom you into a scale. You can zoom to the extent of a particular data layer. You can use an advanced filter to actually basically do a definition query so that only portions of a particular data layer um, show. You can actually change the symbolization on ours. And this is something I forgot to notice as you were doing the granite uh, viewer. So this actually allows us to go in and use the attributes to, um, or not use, or just change that the uh, symbology, but also to use the attributes to change the symbology and affect the symbology if we want to. For many, I think for most of the data layers. Um, what was another thing I wanted to show? Oh, this will tell us the visible scale. Uh, we can have labels or not turned on if labels are enabled. And then the final thing uh, is that there is a link to the metadata and the ability to download. So I want to point out that this is not a, um, a clip and zip type of download. It's not like you've zoomed in on the map and now you can download just the data, uh, just the extent that you're seeing. But it does take you out to a search results table that will allow you to download the data and also link to the metadata for that layer. And that is true for all the data layers, I believe, I spent last couple of weeks putting those links in, so I'm pretty sure I got them all. Um, similar to Granite, we have some base maps over on the right, meaning background maps. Uh, we offer plain backgrounds imagery, which in this case is the Vermont color imagery, and then the second option is the Esri imagery. Um, we also have the hill shade option, the color hillshade, and topo maps as well. So lots of different options in the oops, in the base maps on the right. We also have the little I want to drop down that gives a few different uh, options in terms of things people might commonly want to do. That, that basically is just giving you quick access to functionality that you can get in other ways as well. Um, Leslie, just two quick yep. things to follow up on what you said. Mm -hmm. it, it, at the Granite View, on the left side, there's something called Quick Tools, which I think is very similar to your find the thing quickly. Yep. And also, I'm noticing for some of the layers, you can control the symbology. On the so Granite. All of them, but some of them you can on, on okay. Granite for, well, similarly. Which is which I have to say is a really nice feature. I mean, just a few years ago, I think right before either the first version of our Geocortex viewer or right before we had the Geocortex, you could upload shape files, but then the symbology was just set to some very simple and not always that useful uh, symbology. And now even your uploaded data, you can change the symbology, which is really, really helpful. So that, that's an exact lead into a question that's been asked, which is mm -hmm. when you bring in a shape file, there's no way to have the symbology preset to what it is in desktop. Is no. There? 
No. So, but you can change it once it's up. Right. Yep. I think that's something that, that just isn't, uh, and again, I don't know if that's a future ability, but this, this system definitely is not decided designed to help you move from desktop into this. That would be more of an ArcGIS Online um, type of an operation. Uh, let's see. Oh, and we have this little link that says Get GIS Data, which again, it's a little bit of a fake out here because it's really just giving you a link back to our data warehouse on our website. I'm trying to remember if there's anything else that I wanted to point out. We've got pretty much all the same options in here. Upload and draw. Oh, one thing I wanted to point out is if you do the identify query, I just noticed this when I was practicing this the other day. Oops. Um, if you if you buffer it. Oh, maybe that was it. If you add buffer to markup. I just want to point out that I, I did something, and I think this is what it is. I think I added um, um, a buffer. I used a buffer, and I added it to markup. And what that means is that in order to get rid of this, you do have to go back to the draw uh, area in order to clear it. There's no, um, there's no clearing operation in here in the buffer area, or in the uh, identify area. All right, I think the one other thing I wanted to point out was the question about saving a project. So, and this is why I noticed actually I have a question for you guys about Granite because I didn't see the open project button over there. I saw the save and it may just have been the, the way the viewer, the screen was, but um, if you've created something and you may have drawn on the map, you may have added data layers or just turned things on and off in a way that, you know, your map is the way you want it to be, um, you can then, I guess I put this here, um, create a saved project in a sense, and it's a .gvsp extension. So you can give it all sorts of names. Information. And once you've done that, what you've saved really is information about how zoomed in you were, what layers you had turned on or off. It does actually save copies of any uh, drawings that you've put on the map or any data that you've uploaded to the map or any uh, links, URLs to map services. And all of that will get saved in there. It's not saving a picture of the map. That's an important thing to understand. And then if you were to go back and open that, that file, and remember, um, this is something you could now email to someone else, um, or you can just save it yourself. You can do it. You can make a link to it somewhere. Well, no, you couldn't make a link to it, but you can save it. You can share it with someone else. And in order to open it, they have to do what I just did, which is click on the Open Project button, and then it will actually open it up. I haven't tried it recently, actually, but in the past, it was not the type of file that you could double click on and have it just automatically open the map viewer. You do have to actually open it within the map viewer. Yeah, and that's very slick. I do see the save button. That's a good question. Maybe you haven't activated that feature yet, or I, I, if the Granite folks are still on the line, maybe they can comment, or I can follow up with them later about it. Um, two questions. Could you bring in a layer file has been asked rather than just a shape file? But I don't think that would work because a layer file won't have the shape file data right. with it, yeah. and I don't think layer package would work either, probably. No. If people know differently on the line, feel free to type in with a comment. And there's another question, are there any webinars on the books, or we're thinking about, they'll actually show you how to build these interfaces using these components. Oh, so how to build the GeoCortex our interface? ArcGIS server, Silverlight, GeoCortex, how, to, how did you create or how did VCI or how did Grant actually create right. these web map interfaces? And of course, that's very different than what the purpose of this webinar was, obviously. Um, it's an interesting idea, something that Leslie and I can talk about. I could also point, point something out, which is that, um, that 
at Spring New York next week. Hey, that's good. <laughs> there is actually going to be a, let me see if I can find it. Um, yeah, Vermont Na Vermont's Natural Resources Atlas. So the Agency of Natural Resources um, has an atlas that's built on the same platform, built on Geocortex. And so I think that, uh, let's if we read that, I think Eric is going to talk about how to create, yeah, tips and methods for creating your own map and querying our, well, I, I'm not sure how much he's going into how he made it or if it's mostly about using it, actually. Given that audience, I would think he would do at least some about how to create it. So that's the Northeast Arc Users Group uh, website. You can start there, northeastarc.org, and there's a link to the preliminary schedule. And Spring Arc, as you can see, is May 13th. And the early bird pricing ends today. Today, so that's right. <laughs> wait, don't wait. Sign up don't now. Wait. Do it by midnight, before midnight tonight. Get $10 off. Okay, I see some more questions here. Um, one, one just follow up. Oh, on yes. Faye did say, she says that they have the save and the open button on the interface. Yeah, but I, do you see Faye, the open? Open, but maybe I'm just not looking in the right place. All right, I'm going to do an identify real quick just so that you can see. Um, let me see what a good... buildings is usually well no oh, parcels um, all right why is that not all right there's some parcel data so uh, John asks about accessing attributes so I'm just going to do a quick, uh, so I just clicked on this parcel, and notice that when I click on the map, it doesn't really know which data layer I'm trying to query, so, um, and I'm using the point query here. So it gives me three different layers that exist in the spot where I clicked. So the parcel data, I've just opened up the attribute data to see what's there. There's not a lot there, as you can see, but there is some. Um, also, it's telling me that I've clicked on a regional planning commission and some contours. So I think that's the, the yes answer to your question, John, which is that you can uh, see the attributes of a specific feature. Um, select several features. Can I then save them as a subset? Resymb okay, no, I don't think you can re-symbolize the ones you've selected. You can, um, as I said, you can do a... Not on this one, actually. Where am I? Oh, I know why. Um, so you can do this advanced filter. So you could use the filter to choose to only have certain features show up on your map, and then you could apply your symbology to only those features. So that would be one way to achieve what I think John is asking for. He says, if I want to select several features, can I save them as a subset and re-symbolize the ones I selected? It's not, you can't exactly do that, but you can do something similar to that. So you can't do like a geographic selection and then re-symbolize those, uh, as far as I know. Um, can I upload a shapefile for my computer? Yes, that, well, <laughs> I say yes when I tried to do it before, obviously it crashed on me, but, um, so that's where you click on add shapefile, you click on OK, you pick your shapefiles, which I'm not going to do right now, um, so this is just because I've uploaded these before, it has gone right to where I have some on my computer, but if you look up here, you'll see it's just it's just on my C drive on my computer. So if you were to have some a shape file on your computer, you could just add it by going here. Maybe I could try it with a better, easier data layer. Okay, airports. 
just to prove that I can do this. All right, so here's the airport's data layer, DBF, PRJ, and shape. And there they are. And notice there are a couple different ways to get back your list of data layers. You can click on show layers here. You can go down here and click on map layers. Um, let's turn the parcels back off. I think I have them on too many places. So there's the airports that I just added as a shape file. So Jeffrey, uh, Jeff Bechtold asks a question, what are the biggest pros and cons with switching to GeoCortex software over your previous web map views? And also, have you used the functionality of creating services to consume on your own devices for field collection? Uh, I'm not sure I can address pros and cons with switching to GeoCortex, because we've been using it enough years now that my memory doesn't really hold on to uh, how it was before. I'm not sure if Faye wants to comment on that at all. Um, uh, well, I guess I, maybe I can a little bit. I can just say I think there's just a ton of functionality here is the main thing. You can do a lot of things. You can bring outside data in, which makes it much more flexible. Um, the improvements in the viewer, including the being able to change symbology, I think has been great too. I don't know if you have any comments on that, Shane. Well, the one thing I would say, though, of course, is that the ability to create feature services and collect data doesn't necessarily have to have anything to do with GeoCortex. I mean, that's mm -hmm. just an ArcGIS server or ArcGIS online subscription account feature. So I don't know if there may be additional things that Geocortex provides that I'm not aware of, and I haven't have to admit I haven't worked at all with the with the software or the technology. But you don't need Geocortex to have a feature editable feature service that you can consume with tablets or smartphones and then collect data in the field. Sure, there's additional features and maybe things you can do better or differently, but yeah, and with GeoCortex specifically? Well, unfortunately, I wish I could actually speak to that because um, here at VCGI, we have been working on the broadband grant, and, um, and I know that my colleague who works on that actually did have an issue with helping the department, the, well, it's either the VTA or the Department of Public Service go out and do some field work and collect. They were trying to verify something to do with the uh, network, and I think they ended up switching from using ArcGIS online to GeoCortex. So they did end up creating a, a mobile collection app of some kind using our GeoCortex. Um, and, it, and it worked. And so <laughs> that's a really stupid, vague answer. But I do know that, that we did actually create something like that for them. Um, I just wasn't involved in it, so I don't really know the details. So. So we have gone a little bit over our time, and I suspect that people are leaving us. So if anyone has any other questions to throw at us, this is a good time to do it. But if not, I appreciate everybody participating and asking lots of great questions, and I hope this was of interest. Okay. And you can always send us more um, questions to Shane or I. You can get my contact info on the VCGI website. One one quick thing, Leslie, mm -hmm. before we go, is that... Um, from a geocortex standpoint, from my understanding of it and from talking with other people, one of the advantages is being able to create the web map interface and then deploy it with different viewers. Mm -hmm. So this one, ours happens to be Silverlight. Oh, right. It looks like yours is as ours well. Ours is too. Yeah. Create it once and then deploy it on Silverlight, mobile, you know, Flex, HTML5, which I think they have. I don't know if they do. Has advanced some of the others, but. That's, that's, to me, that's the whole point of using something like Geocortex, as mm -hmm. opposed to having to develop something independently for each of those, and then be responsible for keeping each of those up to date. If you keep your mapping project in Geocortex up to date, they're the ones that do the translation out to these different types of viewers. Mm -hmm. um, and 
Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, different people in, um, so in Vermont, there's a number of different state agencies that share this uh, GeoCortex server, and, um, oh, and George Davis points out, GeoCortex will be at the New York Spring meeting as well, if anyone wants to ask them questions down there. Um, oh, yeah. And uh, I was just going to say, different people in state government are in, here in Vermont are actually implementing it differently. So I know that the 911 board has chosen to use the HTML5 viewer, which from what uh, my colleagues here say, has a little bit less functionality. Um, but I know that it's an attractive option because it is much more friendly to things like um, phones and iPads and stuff. It's much more mobile friendly. So that's one of the reasons that uh, HTML5 option is a good one. Uh, someone just reminded me to point out the link to the YouTube site where this will be posted. So if you go to the front page of our website, the easiest way to get to the YouTube page is just to click down here where it says connect with us. You can also just look up uh, BCGI or Vermont Geospatial on YouTube and you'll find us. So there's our last one that got uploaded and I will do my best to upload this tomorrow. So thank you for that reminder. Okay, I don't think I have anything else. Do you, Shane? No, that the very last thing I'll say is that I should there should be an open button on our interface. It's a, can't really figure out why it's not on there right now, but the function is there, and it's, other people are looking at it and they see it. So the same save and open function you have yep. should also in Granite View too. It's just not showing up on yours for some reason. Okay. That happened. All right. Thank you very much, Shane, and thank you, everybody. Thank you, Faye, for for chiming in, and uh, and I look forward to answering any other questions you guys have by just sending them via email, and we'll, we'll we will do what we can to answer them. And don't forget to, if you use our, the VCGI viewer, don't forget to click on the. Um, oh, that's what I should point out. There's a link to our feedback survey right here on the interface if you'd like to do it after you've played with it a little bit. So thank you.